Welcome to Pittsburgh Tomorrow with Tom Peterson, a show of and about Pittsburgh. Now, here's Tom Peterson. Hello, everyone. Many Americans fear another Vietnam War type involvement by the United States in Central America. The debate rages on in Main Street America as well as in the halls of Congress. The Reagan administration maintains a takeover by the communists in El Salvador would be disastrous for that entire part of the continent and that all of Central America is the real goal of the leftists, including the Panama Canal. The civil war in El Salvador is creating many problems for that part of the world, problems of uh, economic, political, military, and social nature. One big problem is that of the refugees that are having to uh, be forced out of their homes in El Salvador and other parts of Central America. Well, my guest on Pittsburgh tomorrow, Mary Solberg, will address some of these problems. She is coordinator for Central American Concerns for the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. She's also author of a comprehensive study of the plight of the Salvadorans. Ms. Solberg is implementing plans currently for legal and financial help for Salvadoran and other Central American refugees. Mary, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Nice to have you with us, I'm sure. There is a great fear, as we said in the introduction, by many Americans that we are getting into a Vietnam-type situation in Central America with the El Salvador thing. Is that, is that blown out of proportion, or is that a genuine fear? I think it's certainly a genuine fear on the part of the American people and many members of Congress, as you mentioned. I think the chances of its materializing are also um, exacerbated by the way the administration is looking at the situation in Central America. I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, the State Department feels that the United States security interests are at stake, um, that the, the line has been drawn in El Salvador against outside communist interference, which they're afraid will spread throughout Central America and take over and ultimately threaten our interests. And I'm afraid I think that's probably a misrepresentation of what's actually occurring in El Salvador, and I think in that sense, it's not only in the long range, uh, long range uh, uh, disinterest or non-interest of this country, but also in the short range. Uh, it's a tragic mistake that we're making in El Salvador. What is the real problem there then? Do you, in other words, you're saying that it's exaggerated about the, the military threat and the, the uh, threats to our security interests there? Yeah, I think two things. Uh, one thing, I think this kind of a policy emanates generally from a, a way of looking at the world that divides it up into the East and the West, uh, them and us, uh, the communists and the non-communists. And the disturbances in that way of looking at the world are always ascribed. I'm sure the same thing is true in the Soviet Union. Anything that goes wrong in their sphere of influence, they ascribe to American imperialism. And anything that happens that disturbs our sphere of influence, we naturally ascribe to the communists. I think this is really simplifying uh, what is actually a very long, historically rooted uh, set of circumstances in Central America, particularly in El Salvador. Uh, for decades and decades, even centuries, uh, the people in El Salvador have been exploited, have been living in, in tremendous misery and poverty. And for the last 50 years, there's been a military dictatorship in that country. Uh, I was speaking a few days ago with a former ambassador to El Salvador, a man named Murat Williams, who was there in the beginning of the 60s. And he's pointed out that they have never needed communist interference to complain about the misery of their lives. Uh, what's happened most recently is that I think a large number of people in El Salvador have become fed up with the repeated promises of fair elections and, and reforms in land and political institutions that have never materialized. And so they have finally, despairing of finding any democratic means to, to make their voices heard, they've taken up arms to overthrow what they see as a very oppressive government. Now, the Reagan administration has, in kind of implied terms, criticized the Carter administration for non-involvement or virtual non-involvement there. Are you implying uh, by what you're saying that perhaps Carter was right? Well, I think uh, what's... Or that we're going too far in, in our interference in this, in this uh, sphere of influence there? Well, I think as, as the situation in El Salvador becomes more and more a matter of news, there are more and more people who are looking seriously not only at U.S. involvement in El Salvador, but our past policies with regard to Latin America and Central America in particular. Um, our interference, if you will, and our intervention in Central America has taken military form many, many times even in this century. Uh, I think it's, it's fair to say and it's important to note that the United States has a tremendous influence in Central America, uh, an influence which it can use positively or negatively. Uh, and I think that influence has got to be used with, with uh, a clear understanding and a realistic assessment 
of what's happening in Central America, uh, to try to solve uh, a problem that is essentially economic, political, and social, and long, with long historic roots by military force, I think is a real mistake. All right, now we are supporting, in essence, a military junta. That's or, right. It's a right wing, mm -hmm. uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, correct? Mm -hmm. These, uh, the, the, the military junta is perhaps as repressive uh, in its dealings with, with the citizenry there as, as the leftist guerrillas. Am I incorrect in saying yeah, that? Yeah, I think this is something else that really, uh, that it's a very important point to clarify. Um, there's very little question in the, in the records or the minds of international observers in El Salvador, including uh, the Organization for American States, Human Rights Commission, Amnesty International, many church groups who have visited and studied uh, what's happening in El Salvador, and the legal aid office of the Archbishop in, in San Salvador itself, that the government is responsible for well over two-thirds of the killing and the terrorism that's occurring in El Salvador. Um, on the other hand, I think the characterization of the left as a bunch of uh, bloodthirsty mm -hmm. communists who are being directed by, by Havana or by Moscow is really uh, doing a disservice to the opposition in, in, San in El Salvador and to the people of El Salvador. The opposition, in fact, consists uh, of, a, of a continuum of political points of view. On the one side are very moderate uh, political types, uh, cr members of the Christian Democratic Party, which is the party of, of uh, Jose Napoleon Duarte, the current president of the junta, um, ranging through uh, religious people, professional people, students, university professors, social workers, and a very, very tiny, on the other end of the spectrum, a very, very tiny Communist Party, which has never had any impact of any sort in the political spectrum in El Salvador. So that this is really a coalition of all those who are opposed to the current government in El Salvador, and not simply a small cadre of communists who are, who are bent on overthrowing what the State Department characterizes as the legitimate government, government of El Salvador. Do you think the free elections uh, and I, I guess we can put that in parentheses or in quotation marks. Will that uh, help to straighten out the situation there? I really rather doubt it. I really rather doubt it, and, and for the following reasons. For the last 50 years, in the longest continuous military dictatorship um, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, the, the Salvadoran people have been promised free and fair elections. Each time those elections have been held and the people have elected someone, if that candidate has not been the favorite of the military, which really holds the power in, in El Salvador, that person has been set aside and their candidate has been put in as the ruler. In fact, this happened in 1972 when Jose no Napoleon Duarte, who's the current president, ran for president in a coalition of political parties, which included a tiny little communist party a segment. He ran as a Christian Democrat. He was elected by everyone's observations. Mm. He was elected. Mm. But before he could take office, he was arrested, tortured, and exiled to Venezuela by the, by the military um, rulers in, in El Salvador, and was not brought back to El Salvador until 1980 when he, his presence as a civilian and, one, and a man who had had, at one time, great popular support uh, was required in order to make this a civilian military junta and not just a military junta. And at that point, he was brought back in and instated as president, not by popular election, but, but at the will of, of the military uh, junta. What, uh, what is the alternative? Now, you seem to imply or you, you say directly that the military in intervention is not the answer. What is the alternative to uh, creating uh, a democratic atmosphere, as mm -hmm. it were, in El Salvador and the entire area of Central America, if it's not military? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think we need to understand a little bit of the context. Uh, some of the historical context that, I, that I've sketched in, I think, is very important to keep in mind. It's also important to, for us to keep in mind that there are a great many people in El Salvador who are perfectly capable and, and, and in many ways a great deal more capable than we are of figuring out how their country needs to be changed and what kinds of structures need to be constructed in El Salvador in order for the people to really express their will. At the same time, the tremendous mm -hmm. influence that the United States has can be used positively or negatively. Mm -hmm. And I think the positive uh, use of our influence would, would not only serve our, our short-term interests and the, certainly the interests of the people of El Salvador much better, but would, in the long term, uh, prevent the kind of thing that, we, that the State Department is so afraid is going to happen, which is that all of Central America turns against us. At this point, it's very interesting that the people of El Salvador make a very clear distinction between the North American people and the State Department. Uh, 
because they're very clear that there is a government policy being pursued with tremendous influence and a military face at this point that they cannot believe the North American people support because it's destroying them and it's destroying their country. So I think if we can, if we can uh, respond positively to a suggestion by President Portillo of Mexico, for example, to negotiate, to essentially say, you, you, and you will sit down at the table and you'll discuss this instead of, instead of killing one another, instead of our sending military equipment in, to bring our good offices to bear on discussions and negotiations that will first stop the killing and then enable free and fair elections to occur. I think this would be a much, much more constructive way to approach the problem than continuing to send increased military aid. What about President Reagan's uh, Caribbean Basin Initiative? Is that the kind of thing that, that is needed there? Uh, in an earnest effort, I mean, uh, well, I think aside from military. It's, you know, there's some question as to, as to the timing. Um, I'm a little skeptical about the, the impact that this particular initiative will have on Central America. I think it's a case, uh, possibly, of too little too late. Um, from what I understand, the particulars of this initiative uh, may add a little bit to what's already being done. But I think, essentially, uh, to take an initiative, the, the intent is probably very good. But the, the actual effect that this will have, particularly on the immediate violence in El Salvador, will be negligible. And I think the first order of business for us in El Salvador is to simply stop the violence, stop the killing that's going on. And the best way that can be done is if, if the alternative is we talk. But the Reagan administration seems to have, at least they purport to have, evidence showing that the Nicaraguans mm -hmm. are creating the insurgency in El Salvador. Mm -hmm. So that is a military operation. Mm -hmm. uh, is that incorrect? Do, do, don't we have to assume that uh, from the evidence that we have that, that the Nicaraguans are fomenting trouble in El Salvador? And if so, how can we fight that in any other way but military? Well, I think it's, again, important to understand a bit of the context, both historical and, and, and current, uh, with regard to Nicaragua. Uh, Nicaragua itself was ruled by uh, a military dictator by the name of Somoza, who was supported by the United States government. When he was overthrown, he owned, essentially, at least half of Nicaragua's economy, an economy which, at this point, is utterly bankrupt. Uh, Nicaragua is not in a position to rattle its sabers in any kind of realistic sense at the United States. This is a country of, of, of uh, a tiny size compared to the United States. Its military forces, no matter how big they are, and Honduras' military forces, by the way, are larger and more numerous than Nicaragua's at this point. But Honduras has a government that's friendly to ours, whereas we are essentially, I think, setting up the Sandinista government and imputing to it something that is indigenously Salvadoran because we, are, we, uh, we have this particular way of looking at the world in which what happens that's not quite to our liking is immediately something we ascribe to some kind of outside interference. I mean, it's interesting, you know, 200 years ago in this country, people got fed up with trying to deal with a government that they felt was oppressive and repressive. They had talked, they had debated, they'd argued, they'd voted, they'd pleaded. They'd done everything they could imagine to, to change the form of government that we had here. And then they decided that the only recourse was to take up arms and overthrow that government by military means. Mm -hmm. And the Declaration of Independence spells it out. People will suffer as long as evils are sufferable. They don't change institutions for light and transient causes. But when they can't suffer the evils anymore, it's their right and their duty to overthrow that government that is oppressing them. And I think. I certainly hadn't read that passage for a long, long time. And when I looked at that, I thought to myself, gee, you know, it would be, it would be uh, really enlightened of us if we could imagine that there might be another people somewhere else in the earth mm -hmm. that might experience that same set of circumstances and that we could somehow understand in a historical context their need and their will and their right to do that without sim simply and immediately saying someone else is making the trouble in that country at our expense. I think that's a bit too simplistic. Is there, a, is there a growing parallel here with the situation in Central America and the Reagan administration's concern, whether it be misdirected or not, with what happened in Vietnam, the fact that we had a mass infusion of 600,000 troops there, mm -hmm. and when it turned out, uh, hindsight is better than foresight, as we all know, but we found out that we 
we were all the time in a, in a no-win situation, mm -hmm. and that we really supported a, a, a bankrupt, or whatever word you want to describe, regime of the South, South Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. is, there, is there a parallel? Well, I think I mean, there, are some, there are probably some very striking parallels. There's some key differences. And, and uh, without going into them, I think it ought to be said that there are some very important differences. The similarities that strike me are that we seem, um, now as then, not to be appreciating the historical context, the struggle of a people within its own country, the problems that country itself has experienced mm -hmm. that might generate this kind of rebellion. This is one thing. We, 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 we walk in and we describe a situation in terms that are not really uh, realistic or relevant. And we struggle then to, to support that point of view, to justify ourselves, to save face, if you will, for months and months in the case of El Salvador, years and years in the case of Vietnam. Um, at the beginning of a, of a film that's recently come out called El Salvador, Another Vietnam, which is making this striking parallel, the beginning of the film, there are some film clips from 1954, I believe, the initial U.S. involvement in Southeast Asia. There are a few helicopters landing and a few military advisors. And then we see the Secretary of Defense at the time reassuring the American people that there's no anticipation of wider involvement. And then there's a, a, a cut to El Salvador in 1981, and there are a few helicopters landing and a few military advisors, and the reassurances of members of the State Department to members of Congress that we an don't anticipate any further involvement. And yet the military aid that has been given to, to El Salvador in the last year has exceeded what we've given to, to El Salvador, certainly, and to many other Central American countries in years and years past. So I think there is some reason to believe that based on the same um, analysis of the situation, which I believe is faulty, that we may be involved in, in, a, in an escalating involvement, which looks something like Vietnam in that respect anyway. Is it exaggerated then that to think that uh, the communist goal is to take over, I've seen this in, in news accounts, in, in uh, national news magazines, that the avowed goal of the communists are number one, to take over you know, one by one of these countries, eventually the Panama Canal, perhaps even the Mexican oil fields with all that, that all that implies. Is that, is that uh, kind of uh, seriously exaggerated? Well, <clears throat> I don't want to go too far afield as far as uh, um, some kind of speculation is concerned because um, I think a great deal of it has to be speculation at this point. Um, I have a feeling that in many instances our misinterpretation of what has occurred in many third world countries has led us to set up situations in which what we say we fear actually occurs. For example, in the case of, of Castro, there was, there was a moment in history when Castro overthrew Batista that we all applauded. We were delighted that this terrible... <laughs>